feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Hey everybody and welcome to the post show wrap up video here on the Central Pennsylvania Shrimp Tank. I'm your co-host Nathan and Bowden. What was I? Mantis. The Mantis shrimp shrimp. today. Yeah, excellent. The most intellectual shrimp in the sea. Yes, you're welcome. And you're the you're survivor welcome, too. You survived the holiday season, I did. right? I did. Still Alongside still breathing. Mr. Bougie Bouge, Taylor Ranker. We just got done interviewing John Gilliland of Investment Real Estate LLC. And you can find that full replay on our website at shrimptankpodcast.com slash central PA. Also, be sure to go to your favorite podcast app, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, iHeartRadio, and search for the Central PA Shrimp Tank and click that subscribe button so you can keep up to date with all the entrepreneurs we have the privilege of interviewing on our show. And earlier, uh, when we were on the podcast, we got a lot of fantastic information. We're going to cover a little bit of it today, but we learned all about John's background. We learned about uh, why he got into self-storage. Uh, we learned about some of his challenges in going through the Great Recession in 2008, 2009, and how that helped shape his entrepreneurship path. Uh, and just a lot of good stuff. And we had a lot of fun. So again, check the full replay out. Uh, go to our website, shrimptankpodcast.com slash central PA. And I guess the first thing we should do is just allow you to formally introduce yourself and uh, tell us probably the, the most important question, which is why self-storage? So, um, again, John Gilliland, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate that. Uh, why self-storage? Great question. I get that fairly often um, st simply because that is the best returns I've ever seen in any other commercial property type. Mm. It, it's, it's really that simple. And uh, uh, getting, as, a, as a commercial real estate broker, I had the luxury of seeing lots of different investment types, uh, multifamily, uh, office buildings, retail, industrial. And um, when I looked at self-storage for the first time, I looked at those numbers. I thought, wow, holy smokes. That's Can you a, touch that's on that exactly story just a little bit, the deal that actually happened? It's, yeah, it's so, transformative. Yeah, that's uh, so Hanover, Pennsylvania. I was referred to a gentleman who owned two self-storage facilities in Hanover. I went. I did a uh, opinion of value, as us brokers do, for that uh, for that gentleman and uh, valued his facilities at $2.65 million. I asked him how much he'd spent to build those facilities. He said about a million dollars. So it was, a, it was a crazy amount of equity he built. Uh, just by building them and then filling them with tenants, you know, income producing properties. Yep. And I thought, wow, that's that's what I want to do. And I think this is my ticket out of corporate America. Hmm. Also, well, no, wait, now, because there's a, yeah. the next piece of that, the prudential piece. And can you finish that, John? Like how that yeah, evolved? I, so, yeah. So I, I just thought that was amazing. Absolutely. So, so um, four days after I listed the property for sale, I worked for High Associates at the time. Uh, we get a fax at the corporate office in Lancaster from a company, the second largest company in the country, I believe at the time, uh, you store it, uh, who since has morphed into a public company, CubeSmart, who's mm -hmm. the oh, third yeah, yeah. largest public company in the in the space. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so they said, we're looking to buy self-storage facilities. And my manager, Ling Good, handed that paper to me and said, hey, here, call these guys. And I called them and they said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. We'll be right out. And they come out and to see the facility. I think we negotiated for a couple hours on the sales price. I uh, went to a contract, and sure enough, I sold it to them three months later. And during that process, they said to me, "Wow, we would we would we would like to buy self storage facilities all over the country. If you if you're a broker and you'll find these self storage facilities for us, um, we'd love to buy every one you could list." And I thought, "Hey, wow, there, right, yeah, <laughs> right. there's the business ball. idea." So. I did that. So first up, you sold the facility. Second of all, I decided that I was going to be my own man, have my own company. So I formed the brokerage company, Investment Real Estate, to broker nothing but self-storage facilities all along okay. the Mid-Atlantic and all along the East Coast, Mid-Atlantic and, and Northeast states. And then I also uh, then went ahead and realized I wanted to be on the ownership side as well. So I bought the first piece of land with my family near State College, Pennsylvania, yep. and we developed our first facility. 50, hey, by the way, we are. A, yeah, we are. You have to are, plug yeah, that in there, right? That's right. We, uh, if I ever write a book, it'll be called 54 Units in a Cornfield because that's exactly what it was <laughs> way back then. I like when. it. That's a great title. That is a great title. Yeah, that's a great title. So um, let's talk about, because you, you're clearly an entrepreneur, clearly a, a business owner. You cl clearly have that mind. But uh, it can be easy to uh, get just caught up in the business and not kind of working on being a business owner. So what do you do daily? Do you have routines or things you do daily that help to really hone and sharpen your skills as an entrepreneur? Um, I do, and I and I think about it. It's a it's a it's a conscious effort I have um, to 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 work and grow 
both my business, but on me personally as well. So a lot of habits that I do. So wake up pretty much the same time every morning. Um, I'm a big believer in meditation now uh, for the last four or five years. I'm a big believer in affirmations. Yep. So uh, I love goal setting. I've always been a goal setter, but now I've kind of the next level is the affirmations that you read to yourself daily. And mm. it's, it is crazy amazing that I have to be careful what I write down on the affirmations because it comes true. Oh, uh, yeah. And so if you if you put some material goals in your affirmations, next thing you know, you're like, oh, my goodness, this, all, this deal is so good. It <laughs> fell in front of me that now i got to come up with the cash to buy yeah, that yeah, thing, right? right? Yeah, so right. be careful on the materialistic things you put in your affirmations. So a lot of affirmations. Um, a lot of processes with the goals. So every Sunday before I get looking at the work week, I look at my goals for that year and mm-hmm. even long-term goals. And so I plan my week based upon what I want to achieve for that quarter and what I want to achieve for that for that year. So I think that's really critical um, to your success is always be thinking about the big picture. And, mm. and one of the things that I see in business that a, a lot of new or young entrepreneurs, and even some that have been doing it for many, many years, a lot of people have started a business, but what they really have is a job mm-hmm. for themselves. Yes. So, so I always wanted to have a business where I didn't have to carry my cell phone all the time, where I didn't have to be in the office all the time, that I could go on a trip to Africa for mm. three weeks or a month and not worry about Things business getting apart. done. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yep. And so I've always tr- I've always hired the people that can do that and kind of train myself to do that. So so I've always worked on my business, not necessarily in my business. Yeah. That's and great. And so it's it's been wonderful. We're kind of at that point now, and when you empower empower your people to operate that way, it's it's refreshing for them, it's refreshing for me, and it's just it's a wonderful situation. There's two takeaways I got there. Process mm-hmm. is one of them. And also discipline. Yeah. Lots of discipline. Lots of discipline. Tremendous amount of discipline. Yeah. Of discipline. Of discipline. One thing, too, yeah. I think we should definitely touch on because people, I know this from our entrepreneurs, from myself, people, and I've been in my industry 31 years and they'll see me and say, they kind of make this false assumption that this I'm an overnight success. And that's absolutely not the case. I've almost won under two in 2009. Do you mind sharing a little bit about what was the financial crisis like? Sure. I, it ain't I'm always easy, to, Yeah, right? it's not always easy. So is, a lot of my friends are entrepreneurs as well. And, and uh, you know, my office, you can see from the main road. And so uh, they'll drive by Sunday morning at 6.30 a.m. And, and my car's in the parking lot and my light's on in my office. And they would call me up on the phone and say, hey, I see you're getting lucky again. Because we all get <laughs> about getting, getting lucky. lucky. Yeah. And that's, that's, good, our, yeah. that's our inside joke that right. we're all getting lucky, lucky is, yep. you know, is I get emails from my buddy at 1 a.m., you know, and <laughs> yeah. he's getting lucky again. Yeah. You know, working yeah. on his business. So uh, uh, the financial well, well. the financial crisis in 2009 was was crazy. So I I went into that uh, into that uh, uh, time with uh, six of my self storage facilities were less than 30 percent occupied. Mm. And so so you understand it takes about 60 65 percent occupancy to break even. So I was short hundreds of thousands of dollars per month in loan payments that the business was not producing, uh, and that I had to make through other sources. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, that didn't last for too long, and uh, we needed to make some changes and do things differently. And so we had lots of conversation with our bankers, our partners, and uh, it was um, it was pretty gory, blood and guts for a number of years there. But uh, we got through it. We're better for it. We learned lots of lessons, and uh, we're still here. Can we're you part of the Survivors Club. The Survivors Club. The quick piece too, real yeah. quickly about you had said you had your advisors around a table, your wife even. We did, and and, and how that and if. If there were a vote, how would that go? And so, so one of the reasons I believe I survived the the, the real estate recession or the Great Recession um, is that I had lots of great mentors, lots of help, lots of people that were that worked to get me through that. So, one of the adv- pieces of advice from John Dame was to make sure that your wife knows what's going on. It was painful for her, lots of tears, but she needed to know how dire this was. So mm-hmm. she was in that meeting. I had probably four different attorneys in that meeting. You know, my personal attorney our real estate attorney we had a bankruptcy attorney in there because that was some of the conversations we were having mm, yep. just in case yep. uh, that how that how that works um, all our accounting firm and the various accountants we had a number of my business coaches and mentors were also in that meeting a couple partners were in that meeting as well so we had everybody around the table had a vested interest in me and what we were doing and so uh, um, uh, some unbelievable amount of conversations if, it, if they were having a conversation, it was a little low. I was slowly on my calculator figuring out what the hourly rate was I was paying for all those <laughs> people habits, to be right, around right, the table. Yeah, 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 it was yeah. a big number, yeah. but well worth it. And um, and so we worked through the issues hmm. and worked through the problems and figured out a solution, and we executed that solution. So and your decision was, a, was not 
to, to declare bankruptcy. Yeah, right. we had if we if we had take if we were going to take a vote at one point in time, I think uh, three quarters of those people sitting around the table would have voted to pull the bankruptcy lever. And uh, I made the personal decision that we were not going to do that. Yeah, I did not want to answer that question on the financial forms for the rest of What's my life. life right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever have declared you ever bankruptcy? Declared, yeah. yeah, yeah. The answer is yeah. no. And it well, will always be no. Let's touch on that because we were just saying earlier how that's not in everybody, right? It takes it takes a, a special type of person to to do a couple things. One, even see the opportunity and seize it like you did when it presented itself in '97, but also to look at the face, look in the face of adversity like that, and say, "No, we're going to make this work. We're going to figure it out, and just keep pushing through." and I don't know if it touches back to your childhood because you come from an entrepreneurial family, but do you think you were born with that, or what? How, how does how does that happen? Good question. So I'm not sure I was born with it, but um, uh, I, you know, I, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, I was a sales guy. I remember, if, and, and going back, we'll show my age a little bit here now. On the yeah. back of the comic books, uh, you could sell burpee seeds and earn all these prizes. They had rafts and baseball gloves and bats and balls and all kind of stuff. And yeah. I always sold. I always sold. Could you fax bit. those too? Yeah, you couldn't. No, way before. <laughs> that was way before uh, fax. Fax yeah. was early like, '80s. No, no, way before. This is this would have been early '70s. Nathan, okay. the baby man to shrink. Yeah. Okay. So I sold that and sold magazines in high school. Sold fruit. So I always sold stuff. So I was I was a sales guy. So I think it's the kind of the sales guy mentality. And then just watching my father and all the entrepreneurial business he had on the farm, and we had. We had Holstein cows, and we had Christmas trees, and he had a company that made a coating. It's called Miracoat, which was kind of this new product wow. that we sold all around the country. And <laughs> and uh, art business, so Ned Smith Prince. Uh, we were very good friends with Ned Smith. He was my grandfather's best friend. No kidding. So those of you that know wildlife art in Central yeah. Pennsylvania would know yeah, Ned Smith. Absolutely. And so we had a Ned Smith art business for many many years. And <laughs> that's wild. And uh, you know we did we did some things with hunting lodges and, and well, outfitting. Hang on. And, so there's a lesson here for the for yeah. the viewers. The culture of your family mattered. Very much right? so. It, yeah. it, so, it, it so our dinner table nurture. conversation was all about you know, yeah. businesses and how mm-hmm. we do things and processes and money. Yeah. And, yeah. and I was, from a very young age, was always allowed in conversations with, with adults, with older people. And we talked lots about business deals yep. and how these business deals got done. And my dad would, would you know, shake his finger at me at the end of the conversation mm-hmm. as an 8 or 10 or 12 or 15-year-old and say, what we just talked about stays right here. And you don't mm-hmm. say anything to anybody because if we do to the wrong person, that may kill the deal. And so I've always had that. You learned that, you know, yeah. That, that that's, you have to have that trust in your partners you're I talking to. i got to start doing that at night at my dinner table, too. Yeah. That's a good, that's yeah. a great yeah. conversation great, with yeah. your kids. Yeah. And actually, speaking of that, through these tough times we just talked about, uh, my kids, even though they were fairly young, they knew that it was not good times with Dad. Mm. And so even to this day, my kids will ask me, hey, Dad, how's business? How are we doing? How's cash flow? You know, And <laughs> nice. they know. Yeah. yeah they yeah. know about that. And so, uh, um, you know, mm. We're doing pretty good today, but they understood what it was like when we weren't doing good. Not so, yeah. And that's and, not know, so many we years ago. Two hundred seventy-eight thousand right. miles on a car before we were thinking about trading it in on another one. Yep. Yeah. Wow. So uh, good life lessons for yeah. the kids. Wow, that is great. Well, uh, if you're watching and you're you're trying to find lessons on what to do to be a better business owner or a better entrepreneur, this is a great great yes. resource. Listen for to the that. whole podcast. Yeah. I encourage so, you listen so to the whole podcast. Seriously, check it out because um, you, you learn from experience. And we said that how it's it's not what happens to you, it's how you deal with what happens to you and turn around. Uh, and you took all that and made it extremely positive. And um, so congratulations very much, for you. Very much. Yeah, the congratulations yes, thank you. For I appreciate you. Thanks for yeah. sharing. Yeah, yep. thank you for Time. sharing. So again, yeah. thank you for being on the podcast earlier, for, for being part of this uh, wrap-up video. For anybody who just wants to either hear your story or maybe they're thinking about, you know, everybody wants to get into self-storage, but if they're thinking about it, what's the best way for them to learn about you and uh, find out about you guys? So um, you can visit our website, irellc.com. Uh, and if you want to check out our self-storage business, you can – Find us at Move In, two O's, M O O V E I N, movein.com. There is nothing cowardly about that at all. <laughs> cowardly. I know, move, I had to throw in a different cow move. joke. Yeah. Like Sorry, it. I'm milking these jokes for all I can. Well, anyways, John, thanks again for being thank on the you, show. Nathan. This has been awesome. Next week on our John, show, thank you. you're welcome. Yeah. Next week on our show, we have David Cordier. 
Cordier Auctions. Our producer actually has a little bit of experience in the auction business, so that'll be interesting to get her perspective on that as well. But again, check out uh, John's website and go to our website to hear his full interview to get some great tips on just continuing to be a better entrepreneur every day. We'll see you next week on the Central PA Shrimp Tank. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank.